Um, hello, everyone. Hi. Uh, <laughs> I'm Katie Beitenmiller. I'm the chair of the Programming Committee for Pittsburgh Free Thought Community. Um, the Pittsburgh Free Thought Community is a 501c3 charity. Our mission is to promote science, reason, and humanistic values in the Pittsburgh area. Um, and this is our monthly lecture meeting. You may have heard about it from Meetup or our website or other sources. But all of our events on our, are on our website, pghfreethought.org. And we have an events calendar where you can see everything on there if you're interested. Um, sign up for membership if you're interested. Um, and tonight, our um, chair of our activism committee, Alex Jackson, is going to be introducing our speaker. So promptly, I will hand it over to her. Thanks, Katie. Thanks, everyone. Uh, as Katie said, my name's Alex. I'm the chair of the activism committee. And if you're interested in uh, discussions like these tonight, you could come talk to me after the meeting, and I'll tell you more about what the activism has plan committee has planned for 2020. Um, so I'm very excited this evening to introduce our speaker, Laura Perkins. Laura is the emergency response organizer for Casa San Jose, which means that she does everything from uh, respond to ICE detentions, organizes advocacy work, including lobbying and door knocking campaigns, and leads sessions such as these to educate allies on ways to be involved. Um, please join me in, work in welcoming Laura this evening. Is that good? Yeah, OK. Hi, everyone. Um, as Alex said, my name is Laura Perkins, and I'm the emergency response organizer at Casa San Jose. Um, I have a, a PowerPoint presentation, um, but I just wanted to say before I start, please interrupt me with questions. Um, I, I prefer dialogue and group and people shouting out. Um, I was told that I have to repeat questions, so if I don't, maybe remind me. Um, but. Yeah, I'll just get started. Um, well, and I guess I'll give you an overview. Um, first, I'll talk about Casa San Jose and what we do. Um, and then I'll go more specifically into my work, uh, doing emergency response and advocacy work. And then at the end, um, I'll focus on uh, ways that people can get involved in Pittsburgh. Does that sound good? OK. All right. Um, so Casa San Jose's mission is um, that we are a community resource center that advocates for and empowers Latinos by promoting integration and self-sufficiency. Um, I personally like to focus on that last hyphenated word. Um, in an ideal world, Casa San Jose would not need to exist. Um, our, the undocumented community um, would be able to advocate for themselves um, and live their lives without fear, but unfortunately that's not the case right now. And so that's kind of why we're here. Uh, so we have many programs. Um, someone actually handed me this uh, at the, you did, what's your name? Liz. Liz, Liz gave me this, so I really appreciate it. Um, Isaac is Immigrant, um, immigrant Services and Connections. Uh, we have two caseworkers uh, that are funded through Isaac, which is funded through Jewish Family and Community Services. Um, and uh, they are caseworkers, so they um, help uh, clients um, getting um, housing, uh, jobs, uh, registering kids for school, um, uh, a lot of different things. <laughs> they do so much um, medical, a lot of medical stuff, um, paying bills, really anything that a caseworker might do, um, our Isaac uh, coordinators do. Um, so that's one part of our work. We have a lot of youth programs. We've expanded recently. Um, we have Jóvenes con Propósito at Berkshire High School, which is an after-school program. Uh, we've actually divided that group into two groups, um, one for newer arrivals, um, because their needs are more um, just kind of learning how to navigate school life here, which is very different. Um, and then the other one is more of a leadership group, kids that have been here a, um, a while. and. Um, you know, aren't, don't have as many day-to-day -day urgent needs. Um, and uh, so we do a leadership program with them. Uh, they actually pro uh, did a presentation at the Racial Justice Summit um, a couple of weeks ago, so we're really proud of them. Uh, we also recently opened a casita, which is like a little house um, in the Berkshire High School. So we're there, um, I forget, yeah, there we go. Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Fridays, 10 to noon, um, just like a resource center there, uh, because we've been finding that um, once, a, once a week after school is not enough. Um, we also have an after school program Monday through Friday with Beechwood Elementary School. We have summer camp. 
camps in Beachview and East Liberty. Um, Beachview and East Liberty in general are where um, the Latino and Latina population typically is in Pittsburgh. Those are two neighborhoods that we've, um, the, where the community lives. Um, and then we also have Puente Sacio del Futuro, which is a Saturday program for kids. So our youth program is growing. <laughs> um, and I meant to say this before I started, but um, as you can see, I am a white person. Um, and I uh, am not super comfortable um, talking on behalf of brown people. And so I think we should all kind of take that into consideration um, when I give my presentation. I can only speak about my experience and my work, um, but if you really want to learn about the Latino community in Pittsburgh, talk to the Latino community in Pittsburgh. I am not the Latino community in Pittsburgh. However much I would love to be, I can never be that. So I didn't, I didn't want to put that caveat. It's pretty obvious, but it's important to say. Um, we also have community organi a community organizer. Um, she does Know Your Rights trainings uh, in the community. Um, we recently uh, partnered with a group called Justice at Work, uh, which has labor and immigration attorneys. And we broke down uh, the Know Your Rights sessions um, for types of work. So construction workers have their own, uh, domestic workers and cleaners have their own, and then um, I forget, oh, uh, restaurant workers have their own because there are different issues um, at play in all of those situations. Uh, we also have monthly community meetings in Beachview and in East Liberty. Uh, we have ESL classes, and uh, we have a le and we have leadership training. Um, that is the thing that I'm most excited about with our community organizing, because that those leaders actually give guidance to our board of directors, um, so that we don't do things and assume it's what the community wants. We only do things when the community, when the leaders come to us and say. You know, this is what we're seeing right now. What can we do about it? And you know, we brainstorm together. Um, yeah. Um, which gets me to emergency response, uh, which is my work. Um, that phone number up there is the emergency response um, number, which I have on me at all times. Um, if it goes off, um, I might have to answer it, and that's just kind of the way it is uh, with emergency response work. Um, so that phone number uh, we give out to anyone and everyone in the community um, to let them know that if they hear rumors about a an ICE detention or if they themselves are being detained in the moment or a family member um, hasn't come home from work, um, that's the type of phone calls that I get. Um, we d I don't just work with ICE detentions, I also work with um, police stops and police detentions because sometimes, unfortunately, too often those lead to an ICE detention here in Pittsburgh. Um, if someone is detained and we hear about it the day of, um, ICE typically operates or detains between 7 a.m. and 9 a.m., Monday through Friday. They don't like to work on the weekends, just like most people. Um, and so, um, after they detain someone, they bring them down to uh, the ICE headquarters um, on the south side, right by the hot metal bridge. They hate it when I tell them the location, tell people the location, so I can tell you it's at 3000 Sydney Street. Um, and so that's where their headquarters are, and that's where they process uh, people that are detained. Uh, once they're processed, it takes a few hours, um, usually by about 3 p.m., um, they are um, the detainees are moved to Beaver County Jail. Um, Beaver County Jail has a contract with ICE, and it's right in our backyard. It is half an hour away from ICE headquarters. <laughs> I've driven it, I can tell you. Um, and, and so we think, like, oh, it's, it's another county, but it's actually very close uh, to downtown Pittsburgh. Um, there, they typically stay just a few days, between two and five days, depending on where the weekend falls. Um, and then they're transferred to Cambria County Prison. Uh, Cambria is about like two hours away, two hours east of Pittsburgh, more or less. Um, Cambria has a larger contract with ICE. Um, and by contract, I mean uh, ICE pays the prison and the county uh, because that's how they're operated um, to house immigrant detainees. Um, the majority of immigrant detainees um, have not committed a crime in the United States. Um, so, so to say, um, the, the crime is having crossed the southern border um, without correct documentation. 
Um, and while I'm thinking of it, I will go into terminology. Um, a person cannot be illegal. Um, I cannot be illegal. I can do illegal things, uh, but a person cannot be illegal. Um, and it also can't be a, a, a noun. You can't say an illegal. <laughs> um, but a, a person can do illegal things. Um, and so just kind of going, I, I just wanted to, you, uh, address the, that terminology. Uh, I use the term undocumented because they cross the border without the correct do documentation. Go ahead. Yeah, it, it, I mean, it's, it's, oh, sorry. Yeah, so his question was, um, when I say that a person cannot be illegal, and he said, is that is that legal terminology, right? Like, is that in law? Um, the terminology that is written in law is the term alien, um, which is very offensive. Um, and all of the paperwork on, like, all immigration and customs paperwork, um, customs and border protection, um, they all use the term alien. And such to the extent that um, Everyone that has been through the immigration system has um, a tracking number, and that is called an A number, and the A stands for alien. Um, that's anyone that's applied for a visa, a green card, that's been picked up by CBP, any of that. Um, so the term they use is alien, um, which is a noun. Um, it's also an adjective, but in this case, it, it's a noun. Um, but yeah, it's, it's extremely offensive terminology that is built into the system, and it reflects the system. I, yeah, so uh, he said, I've heard the term illegal immigrant. Um, again, I don't, the, in that scenario, I illegal is referring to the person. You have an adjective describing a noun, and I, I personally disagree. I don't think that the immigrant is illegal. How they crossed the border um, did not comply with US, current US law, but US law can change. And, um, and, um, yeah, so, so I personally don't use that term, and I don't encourage people to do it because um, it's degrading uh, to these people. How many of the people that you work with entered the country legally with a student visa, a tourist visa, a work visa, and overstayed that visa? Excellent question. Yeah, um, so uh, she asked, yeah, um, how many people that we work with entered the United States with a visa, be it a tourist visa, student visa, yeah, um, most of the people that we work with um, cross the border without documentation. Uh, people that get visas um, typically have more money um, because to get a visa, it's actually quite expensive. Is that, has anyone, has that, does anyone know anyone that's gone through the process? Do you know how much money it costs, like the whole process? 215? Yeah. So, so she, should, she said in Colombia it costs about $400, but that doesn't take into, into account the transportation, uh, paying for transportation to get to the embassy. Um, and if you have one U.S. embassy in the country, that might be like six hours away, potentially more. And not only that, but the opportunity cost involved in that. So you probably had to take off work if it's six hours away. Um, and maybe you had to pay for childcare to do that. So the visa, although the visa itself is only maybe a couple, like, like the documentation is only a couple hundred, um, it, it's quite more than that. Like I, in my mind, it's about a thousand uh, U.S. dollars. Um, and that's not to even talk about the plane ticket um, because most people with visas are able to fly in. Um, does that answer your question? Oh well, and so what you asked about like the numbers. Uh, most of us. Most of our clients do not have visas. Most, most of them um, just came uh, across the southern border. Um, yeah, that was a great question. Uh, when we talk about people that are um, out of status, that could be someone that never had status, that crossed the border and never had any interaction with immigration. But it also could be people that have overstayed their visas or um, you know, maybe um, filed papers wrong and their status has um, Expired isn't the right word, but I think you know what I mean. Um, of all the people that don't have a legal status in the United States, the majority are people that have overstayed their visas. It's not the people that are crossing the southern border. I think that's a pretty big misconception and that the media plays into that and politics plays into that. 
Um, but the majority of people that are not here with a legal status are actually people that have overstayed their visas. Um, for whatever reason, I'm not saying that one is better than the other. It's just um, numerically, uh, that's, that's what it is. Um, so um, as I said, uh, people are picked up. They're brought to the, um, to the ICE headquarters on the south side. Um, and where I come in is if I get the phone call ahead of time, one, if I'm close by, I will go to the site uh, that the detention happened in case the ICE agents are still there. Um, ICE agents typically take, in my experience, 15 minutes in, in total to do a detention. Um, so it's very hard to catch them in the act. Um, they are very ambiguous in, um, in their appearance. It depends, um, but uh, their vehicles are not marked. Um, but they do take those, uh, those lights and put them on top of the vehicle. So really it looks like an unmarked, um, an undercover police officer, honestly. Um, and then when they do wear um, identification, uh, they'll have, um, or uh, by identify, when they wear clothing that uh, um, shows who they are, it's a black vest, it looks like a bulletproof vest. And on the back, has that, does anyone know what I'm referring to? What does it say? Yeah, but it says another word. She said, doesn't it say ICE on it? But it says ICE and it says another word above it. It says police, um, which is, and so you have them putting um, uh, lights on top of their vehicle that looks like an undercover police um, vehicle. And then on their back, it says police and ICE. Um, police is a word that you understand in any language, typically. Um, it, it's, it's an easily identifiable word in English. ICE is an acronym. ICE means cold water. Um, ICE is not immigration. If they put immigration, I think it'd be a lot easier to understand. But you see um, how they use these tactics um, to trick uh, the community, um, which is why Know Your Rights sessions are so important. Um, so uh, if I get the call soon enough, I will try to catch them, um, try to go there and de-escalate the situation. But unfortunately, I, um, I started doing this work in October of not 2018, and I have yet to um, arrive on the scene. Because um, when ICE detains someone, um, in, compar in comparison with police officers, the goal is not to leave a safe scene, right? Police officers, in general, my understanding is that they stay until the scene is safe. That is not the goal of ICE agents. Uh, their goal is to detain someone as fast and easily as possible. And um, when more people arrive on the scene, their job becomes more difficult. So they're in and out very fast. Yeah. Uh, do ICE have the right to enter an apartment without a warrant? Excellent question. The question was, do ICE agents, uh, are they allowed to enter into a building or a house without a warrant? Um, if it's a private, um, if it's a private uh, building uh, and the door is locked, no. Um, if the door is not locked, then you don't need a warrant. Um, and uh, that also goes for, uh, like if it's a business, if it's a restaurant, um, the, the dining room, for example, of a restaurant is a public space. They do not need a warrant to get into the dining room, but they do need a warrant to get into the kitchen or the offices. But if anyone has ever worked in a restaurant, do you typically lock the kitchen door? No, because people have to go in and out on a regular basis. So there's a lot of trickiness. The, knowing your rights is extremely important because it's very difficult uh, to protect yourself. Um, and that's if you speak the language. <laughs> Even if, um, so adding in a language barrier and adding in fear because we act differently when we're scared. It's hard to think rationally when we're scared. And so um, you can see that with intentional confusion, um, ambiguousness, how they we work so quickly, um, how you have to keep doors locked that you don't normally keep, lock keep locked, how you have to ask for a warrant that is not that is in English, and if you don't, if you can't read or you can't read English, that's another challenge. Uh, the warrant uh, does has, have to be signed by a judge. Um, that's a judicial warrant. Um, ICE agents use uh, often what is called an administrative warrant, which is where an ICE agent just writes up what looks like a warrant, um, but it's just them saying, "I want this person," and there's no judicial process involved, and those warrants are not valid. So if a, if a um, ICE agent presents a warrant that has 
my name on it, the correct address, the correct date, it is not valid. And you do not have to open the door for that. Um, but they trick people. Um, if you're, um, cars are considered um, private property. But if you roll down your window, what can an ICE agent do? They can reach in, open the door themselves, and that is now a public space. Um, same is if, you, um, if someone knocks on your door and you ask, who is it? And they speak another language and you don't have a window, and so you open the door a crack to see who it is, that is no longer a private space they're allowed to come in. Um, so it gets complicated, right? There are a lot of intricacies and each situation is different. Um, again, which is why I know your rights are so important. <laughs> yeah? Sure, his question was how many people have been detained in the Pittsburgh area and how many people have been deported. Um, I only started working here, like I said, in October 2018. I can tell you um, the frequency, but total, I, I don't know. Um, my, by my estimates, this can oscillate, um, but about five to eight people per day, uh, Monday through Friday. So that's 25 to 40 per week. Um, with math. Um, deported is a lot harder to track uh, because um, I haven't uh, completed like the, um, the process that uh, people go through when they're detained, but eventually they see a judge, hopefully, and depending on the scenario. Um, but it could take up to years for them to be deported if they get out on bond. Um, they, I think it's I read somewhere, don't quote me on this, but that um, a third of the immigration judge positions are not filled. They're just empty. Um, and um, into immigration court, and it, there's a huge backlog. And they do prioritize people that are detained uh, because it costs them money to detain people. It's all about the money, <laughs> which I'll, I can talk about later. But um, so they don't want to keep people in detention as long. Um, because it costs them money. And so if you're detained, you will see a judge a lot faster. But if you're not detained, um, I went to immigration court earlier this week and their next appointments for 2022, um, the year 2022. And um, for some people that's good, right? If they don't have a good defense and they just, they wanna stay here for, you know, who are we to judge why? But if they don't have a good defense, then yeah, they, that bides them time. But if you're applying for asylum, you can't get a work permit. You can't get a driver's license without a social security number because Pennsylvania is very frustrating. <laughs> um, and so uh, that long process can, uh, we, we take a lot of things for granted and um, it really affects people's lives. I'm not sure if that answered your question. Yeah, go ahead. So the question is, how does ICE know where to find people? Um, which is a great segue into um, policing. The, well, I guess I'll talk about it later. But um, the average case um, that I see of someone detained, when I, when I get a phone call um, about a nice detention, I have an intake form. And I try to figure that out. Why, how do they get detained? Um, one is that we try to notice trends and communicate that to the community um, so that they can you know, use that information. Um, but the typical case is where um, someone is driving while brown um, in a police department outside of Pittsburgh uh, because Pittsburgh police do not collaborate with ICE. But Pittsburgh has six zones and they are not that big. There are 130 municipalities in Allegheny County. Um, and I imagine somewhere around that number of police departments and a lot of them collaborate with ICE. And so what happens is they'll get a speeding ticket um, in Aliquippa, for example, and then two days later, ICE is at their house, if that makes sense. That's the most common one. And so, like, if the, you know, I'll be speaking with the wife and, like, you know, what, what do you think, why do you think he was picked up? And she'll say, I don't know, like, he didn't do anything. And then I'll ask, you know, like, did he get a, any tickets recently from police officers? And she's like, yeah, but he paid it or, you know, um, but that doesn't matter. Um, you can pay, you can, you can comply with all of them, you can be very respectful to the police officer, um, but a, you know, a broken taillight means a lot 
um, has, has a lot uh, heavier consequences uh, for this community. Um, so um, back to this uh, scenario of where what happens to people when they're detained in Pittsburgh. Um, so um, if I can, if I get the call before 3 p.m., um, I will send a volunteer attorney and um, someone who speaks Spanish down to the ICE headquarters. The reason why I have to send a volunteer attorney is that um, I can't even speak with the person that's detained on the other side of the wall. I've heard of the, I've heard their voice. Like they're right there. Um, if it were a see-through wall, I'd be able to see them. Um, but I cannot because I have not uh, passed the Pennsylvania bar. <laughs> um, I'm not an attorney. Um, and so we have vo volunteer attorneys that do all different kinds of law um, that are on call. Um, Monday through Friday, and if they're on call that day and someone's detained, I'll call them and ask them to go down to ICE with their G28 form. It's a form they have to fill out, um, and then once they hand that form over to ICE, then they'll just the ICE agent will hand it to them. Like I can visualize like the five feet that the document goes, um, and on that form is the um, volunteer attorney's phone number, and the ICE agent agent just says, "Here, they're a lawyer." <laughs> Which is frustrating because they're not an immigration attorney, but um, and then they call the attorney's phone number. But um, a Spanish-speaking attorney is hard to find, um, and so that's why we have the volunteer that speaks Spanish, and they the, the attorney passes the phone over to the volunteer, and the volunteer speaks with them. Um, and that conversation is usually fast; they usually don't have that much time. Um, but um, when I train new volunteers, um, the first thing that I tell them to tell uh, the person that's detained is like there are people that care about you and that are watching what is happening um, and that we've spoken with their family members and this is the message that the family member would like to pass on to you um, and then we explain the process to them because the process does, isn't even explained to them where are they going next what rights do they have they should not sign anything if the if the document that's handed to them in, is in English um, <laughs> they should ask for interpretation. If it's in Spanish and they don't know how, and they're illiterate, they also need to ask for interpretation. Um, and so basic stuff like that, we communicate to them. Um, some challenging things is if someone, they're often stopped when they're, um, they're not stopped in their homes because the Know Your Right sessions have been effective and people know not to answer the door when someone knocks. So what they'll do is they'll, the ICE agents will stake out the house for one day ahead of time and see when they leave uh, for work in the morning and if there are children in the vehicle because ICE agents don't like dealing with children. Um, and so if there are children in the vehicle, they'll follow the vehicle until the children is at school, for example, and then they'll pick them up. If there's no child in the vehicle, they will um, follow the vehicle for a block or two, which is so dirty. Um, because it means that the family member that's waving goodbye uh, to their husband or um, family member, um, they don't see the detention. And so they realize um, that their loved one was detained at 6 p.m. when they're not home from work. And by that time, as now you're like learning about my process, it's too late. They're already in Beaver. And it's not too late. It's not like, I don't want to say too late as if there's no hope, but we're missing a key step. Um, of communicating with them and having them communicate with us because um, if anyone knows anything about the prison industrial complex, they like to make money off prisoners and phone calls are very difficult. Um, each prison um, has a contract with a private company that, um, that has like the phone system and you have to pay very expensive amounts. Like I was talking with someone recently and they spent like $20 a week on phone calls to speak with their husband that like she hadn't been apart from for like 20 years. Um, and so to speak with her husband um, that was detained, she spent $20 a month. And um, typically, th they really only detain men. And um, men are typically the breadwinners of the family. And so when you detain the man um, and you have the woman alone with the children that um, might not work because she takes care of young children, there goes their entire source of income. Um, and when we've been seeing um, people that get out on bond, they're in there for at least a month, usually a month and a half. And so that's a month of rent, that's a month of, um, that they have to pay. 
and food and everything else, but they're also not earning income. So it's like, a, it's twice the amount, right? Um, and so, yeah, $20 a month, like maybe for me isn't that bad, but like you have to take into account like the finances involved in the situation. Um, and, the, and who's making money off that is another important question that we have to ask. Um, so that's why it's important that we um, like learn about the detention the day of so that we can provide immediate services. Um, so I'll get the information and I'll also try to communicate to the, um, to the detainee, you know, that, you know, any information that the family wants to communicate to them and also let them know their rights um, and what to expect. Um, but then um, we also work with the family. Um, emotional support is extremely important um, um, at that time because every detention in Pittsburgh is a family separation. Uh, we, when we hear family separation, we think of it at the border, um, but it's happening in Pittsburgh because when you take a father away from his children, that is family separation and it's happening here. Um, so. Uh, yeah, we connect them with uh, emotional support, but also like help them figure out how to pay rent for the next couple of months, how to get their kids to school now that like the person that had been driving them um, can no longer do that. Um, we connect them with legal services. Uh, Casa San Jose does not have attorney, any attorney. Um, I am not an attorney, which I <laughs> always tell people, um, but. Um, we can, based on the situation, we can recommend attorneys that aren't going to take advantage of them because that's another um, reality that um, happens. People take their money and just not work on the case. Um, so yeah, um, after about a month, month and a half, if they are eligible for bond, um, then uh, they will um, go before a judge um, and hopefully um, get bond. Um, Criminal bonds are typically in like the hundreds of dollars. Immigration bonds are in the thousands of dollars um, because um, what's considered um, in a bond hearing is are they a threat to society and are they a flight risk? Are they going to be, will, if we release them is the, the theory, uh, will they just run away and never um, come back to court? Um, and um, because, Im immigrants don't have the deep roots in the community, this is the theory, um, then um, it's a higher risk to release them. And so that is how they justify um, bonds. The lowest bond I've seen is $5,000. The highest I've seen is 42000 Yeah. Um, but that brings me to the Fondo Solidario, um, which is our bond fund that we started in March of last year. So we're almost a year old. Um, we've got uh, nine people are released. Um, our bond fund is actually a zero interest loan. Uh, the reason we do that, one is so that we're not always fundraising, which is exhausting. Uh, but the other um, is to um, have them put the money back in the system so we can get more people out. And when they are released, um, we ask them to attend community meetings and share their story if they're comfortable with it, if it doesn't trigger too much trauma, which often it does. Um, so that they become involved in the community and the community can learn from the experience. Um, so yeah, and that's a picture of Gustavo. He gave me permission to share it um, and his wife. He was our second bond recipient and he is a dear. Um, yeah, so that's, that's emergency response. Any questions on detentions in Pittsburgh or the legal process or anything like that? Yeah. Excellent question. So the question was, what is the difference between a refugee, someone applying for, for asylum, and other? <laughs> um, so a refugee enters the United States with a status. Um, so a refugee flees country A and goes to country B, and then from country B applies for uh, refugee status in country C. Does that make sense? Um, it takes a long time and it is expensive, even for people that are fleeing famine or war, for example. Um, and so uh, when a refugee comes to the United States, they have legal status. And they also have um, government-funded resettlement programs. Uh, so Jewish Family and Community Services um, works a lot with refugees. Um, and they help people find housing and 
register the kids for school and all those things that um, caseworkers typically do. And it gets funding from the government. And so, um, yeah, so that's kind of the process to be a refugee. Asylum, people that are seeking asylum, first of all, um, the requirements are that you have to be persecuted in your country of origin, in your home country, uh, based on different things. Maybe um, skin color, um, sexual orientation, um, political gr uh, beliefs, association with certain groups. I know there's more. Does anyone? Religious, thank you, religion. Um, those are examples of reasons you can apply for asylum. Uh, recently, domestic violence and gang violence were removed from that list. Um, as you can imagine, um, those are um, rampant in Central America and Mexico where um, the people that we typically work with are from. And so that was a big hit um, legally um, when we talk about strategy for giving them a safe home. Somewhat to apply for asylum, it's a different process. Um, you, you can apply for asylum once you are in U.S. territory, and it doesn't matter how you got there. Um, so maybe you can come on a visa and apply for asylum. Um, you do have to do it within one year of being in the United States. Um, again, why know your rights is so important because people don't really know that. And so people have been living here for 14 years because they were persecuted in their home country. And that time window has expired. And they have to justify why they waited 14 years legally, which can be very difficult when all your documents are home or lost or something like that. Um, but I just want to reiterate that it doesn't matter how you get into, the, into US territory, um, you have a right to apply for asylum. That's extremely important because I think there's a lot of misinformation out there. Um, economic, um, if you're fleeing your country for economic reasons, uh, that is not under asylum. And that is a large portion of the community, community that we have here. Um, and I'd like to propose the question, what are the causes for someone to flee their home for economic reasons? And um, given US policy in Central America, I think we play as a country, <laughs> not individuals, but we play a big role in forcing that exodus. Um, and so denying someone the right um, to apply for economic asylum, for example, um, is hypocritical uh, in, in, in terms of economic politics. We caused this, in, in my mind, there, there's a lot of opinions out there and there's a lot of factors, but we played a big part. And I can go into what happened in Guatemala, Honduras, Nicaragua, El Salvador, Mexico, and what role the United States played in that. Um, but politically and economically, we as a country have ravaged those countries. Um, and so denying asylum based on economics, domestic violence, and um, crime violence. <laughs> Gangs were formed in Los Angeles jails. And when the jails were overcrowded, we deported people. Back to Honduras and El Salvador, for example, and they hadn't been in their country for 15 years. And what networks did they have in those countries? But the, the relationships they made in the jails in LA. And so, of course, they continue in, like, the gangs persisted in those countries. What other option did they have? And so, it's my opinion that the US caused a lot of gang violence in those countries, too. And so, um, you know, it, it's frustrating when we don't take responsibility for our own actions. And, I personally did not do that, but my country did. And so my country's policies don't reflect um, the responsibility I believe that they should be taking. Yeah. Interact frequently enough with local ICE agents? Yeah, so the question was, do I interact frequently enough with local ICE agents to get to know them? They all know who I am. They all have my business card. Um, and my business card has our office address on it. And they know the the community that we work with. Um, they have never come to our office, and I don't think they ever do, because there would be hell to pay, pardon my language. Um, and um, it's interesting. It's, it's a very tentative relationship. Um, I personally don't approve of their <laughs> life choices, the ICE agents. Um, but I need them um, to treat the community well. And so, um, it's a very, I'm a very opinionated person, I'm sure, as you've noticed. And it, it's, it's really tough um, going down there and 
begging them to give me someone's car keys so that I can move his car when that's an easy thing for, that they could do. Um, so have you found that there, can you appeal to their humanity, to their in ways that get them to, I mean, so you mentioned that it's, when you're called in, often it's too late to make some of the early interventions that might mm -hmm. make a difference. But if you got to know sympathetic people at ICE who could help smooth over some of these things for the... Yeah, so he asked, um, like, could I appeal to their humanity and um, uh, ask them to not necessarily do me favors, but like help me out maybe. Um, yeah, it depends on the agent. Some are more um, uh, amenable uh, than others, um, but it also depends on the day. Like a nice agent that like helps, you know, uh, like was more pleasant one day can be a real piece of work the next day, and I don't know why. Um, I can tell you that recently um, there was a court arrest. Um, I guess it was probably like five months ago now um, in the court, or municipal court right next to Allegheny County Jail. Um, someone went there for, I think, like pu public drunkenness, um, a community member, um, which, again, a white person with public drunkenness, like you pay a fine, you know, you go to court, like, um, but he was just sitting there um, waiting to speak with his public defender and ICE came in and detained him in front of, every, it, it was like a big room, twice the size of this, full of people. Um, the judge wasn't there yet and they just walked straight into court and took him. Um, and so like the courts are not safe. Due process is not safe. Um, and we had um, four people accompanying him that day. Um, because we knew that ICE um, has given presence in court and also for emotional support and logistical support. And um, they were the two ICE agents, I believe it was two ICE agents were accompanied by four sheriff's deputies. Um, sheriffs um, do the bidding of the courts. They're like the police officers of the courts. Um, and they facilitated the process. They, um, they grabbed our, um, our accompaniers and like put, put their hands behind their back. One of my accompaniers had bruises up and down her arm. Um, and um, I met the accompanying team down at the ICE office because, again, the community member was on the other side of the wall and they said, like, if you do that ever again, like, the U.S. Marshal's office will be knocking on your door and the U.S. Marshal's are not to be trifled with. I don't encourage anyone to ever get on the bad side of the U.S. Marshal's. Um, but they, for the next, like, couple months, they were, every time I went down to the ICE office, um, they did not give me the time of day. They made me wait for like three hours for a 10 minute check-in. Um, so there is a lot of discretion uh, for ICE officers. And in my experience, they don't typically use that discretion for good, if that makes sense. Yeah. So the ICE officers have some kind of reward or something uh, for each detention? Interesting. The question was, do ICE officers have any reward for uh, detentions? I would really encourage people to write Freedom of Information Act requests to, for that. I don't personally know, and I know that if I asked them, they would not uh, answer me. Um, are you referring to something like a quota, for example? Like they have to detain a certain amount of people? Yeah, have you seen Mexico, they have this kind of, or Colson over South Border, they have this quota. Yeah. Uh, daily quota, um, so they, they take the buses or yeah, so he said in Mexico, like, um, they do detain, like, they do have quotas that they're supposed to meet, right? And that, like, they'll detain, like, you know, they'll do it as efficiently as possible, right? And they'll try to get 10, 15 at a time. Um, I, I personally don't know the internal operations, and um, I can tell you that, um, the, the Department of Homeland Security was established, does anyone know when? Right after 9-11, right bingo. And um, that was in a climate of what was going on in the country right after 9-11. Hysteria is a great word for that, and a need to protect our homeland. It's called Homeland Security, which is very telling, right? Um, and so it, it was created very quickly, um, and not with a lot of, um, accountability involved in the processes uh, because it was created in the name of security. Terrorists attack our country. That's why the Department of Homeland Security was created. Um, and the result is that there 
is very little accountability. There's an Executive Office of Immigration Review, EOIR, um, that takes complaints. I have never seen a complaint be answered. Um, and that could be on immigration judges, although that's the Department of Justice, but ICE agents, CBP agents, USCIS officials, there's very little accountability. Um, and so like, I would really encourage someone to try to find that information, but also good luck. Okay. Um, here's just, if people like numbers, here's some numbers. Uh, they're not super recent, um, but um, deportations have gone up a lot recently. Um, we actually saw a spike under the Obama administration. Um, a lot of people think of Obama as a friend to immigrants, um, especially during, there was like um, in the news all those kids riding on top of trains in Mexico, like that was the Obama administration. Um, he actually did more deportations than anyone up until his um, presidency. Um, so they have like ri steadily risen. Um, that 14 is a big one. Um, the median years in the United States at, at the time of deportation. Imagine living in a country for 14 years. What have you established? What type of life do you have? Um, to have to reform a life after 14 years in one place, um, it's, it's, not, it's not what's being depicted on the news, right? Like, um, on the news, it's like people just came over and they stole your job and it like all happened really fast, but that's not the case. Um, a lot of people have children, for example, within 14 years. And if you have children here, they are U.S. citizens and they can't, they're not deportable because um, they're allowed to live here under the law. And so um, I think that number of 14 is extremely important. 60% um, of the deported in 2006 had 16 had no criminal convictions. Um, one difference under the Obama administration and the Trump, well, there are many differences between the two administrations, um, but one is that the Obama administration, um, when ICE agents were targeting people, they, they really did, um, statistics say that they targeted people with criminal convictions. Um, and what we're seeing, in, in contrast, what we're seeing under the Trump administration is um, collateral arrests. Um, so in that scenario where um, you know someone's leaving for work and they get in their car to go to work um, because people that don't have social security numbers in Pennsylvania can't get a driver's license um, what's way, one way to mitigate um, getting in trouble is to give each other rides right because then only one person's driving without a license instead of five for example and so but if that one person is pulled over by ICE they don't just take the person that's driving without a driver's license, which is a crime in Pennsylvania. Um, they take all five. And so that's another challenge for me when I get a phone call. And not only do I have to ask, you know, did they have any interactions with police recently? Sometimes it's like, how do they get to work? Did they get a ride? Who did they get a ride from? Often they don't know. Maybe they just know the first name. But sometimes, you know, you figure out that the person that gives them a ride to work, maybe they don't even work together. Maybe they, their, works, their place of work is adjacent and they get a ride. And maybe that one person uh, was pulled over by police the day before. Like, so so you, can, you can see the, how convoluted the, this can get. Um, but no, they're not only targeting pe criminals at all. Um, and that number is from 2016. I would, I'm pretty sure that that number is a lot higher now the percentage of people that do not have criminal convictions that are being deported. Um, what else? Um, which one, the 1,700%? Um, that's just um, how many deportations, like the number of people that are deported has gone up significantly. Um, so looking at the time frame from 1900 to 1990, like the average deportation per maybe year or um, location, I'm not, yeah, I'm not sure. Um, yeah, it's not a great statistic because I don't have the, the source or anything, but it's just a number that reflects that deportations have gone up drastically. Yeah. Um, 
And if it does, do you think it'll be for the whole state or just the Philly region? Okay, uh, so she said that uh, New Jersey recently passed legislation that allow undocumented folks to get driver's licenses, and um, like, what what would that look like in Pennsylvania? Um, like, would it just would it be statewide or would it be just the Philly region? I'm so glad you asked that question. Um, I'll skip a little bit ahead, but um, we're part of a statewide coalition that is trying to get driver's licenses for all, um, which I will talk about uh, later. Um, but. Yeah, it would drastically change um, people, like their lives. Um, because if you think about like um, every time you hop on a car, you could be deported, essentially. Um, so like the fear and the anxiety um, that that has on you, um, you know, anxiety often corresponds with not being able to sleep well. And so that affects your work life and like your family dynamics, right? It's like the effects are incredible. Um, actually, the most recent one was New York. Um, that recently passed it. Um, well, yeah, both of them. Uh, no, you're right. It's New Jersey. New York has been implemented. New Jersey has not been implemented yet, but it's, it was passed. And I believe it's somewhere around 14 other states already had that right. Uh, Pennsylvania had that right until, I believe, 2009, uh, when there was a crackdown and they changed the policy so that you need a, uh, a social security number to have a driver's license, but that was not the case. And so when we ask for driver's licenses for all, we're asking for a reinstatement of a right that was taken away from them recently, um, which is pretty important um, because people, are, you know, some people will balk at that idea. Well, they don't deserve driver's licenses or something, um, but they already had them. They were just taken away. Um, but yeah, it's a super important campaign. And then yeah. Yeah, I'm probably going to sum this up real bad. <laughs> but um, so um, in, Puerto, in Puerto Rico, um, there are a few for forgeries of birth certificates. A, a few, I have no idea what the number is. Um, but um, th then Pennsylvania decided to ca categorically deny any birth certificate that came from Puerto Rico, which we can question that logic later. Um, and, um, and so I think you're asking, could that potentially happen with out-of-state licenses? So my understanding of Pennsylvania driver's licenses is that if you have to transfer your license from an out-of-state license to a, um, a Pennsylvania license within six weeks of moving. 60 days. I know there's six in there somewhere. Um, and so, I mean, yeah, I know that Ohio's driver's license policies are a lot more lax, and a lot of our clients um, get driver's licenses from Ohio. It's not really a secret. I'm not like spilling the beans or anything. Yeah, um, and so he said, um, yeah, it's, it's hard to prove that they have been here for longer than 60 days, but the issue, again, is about know your rights, like, um, because they might ask someone, how long have you been living here? And when you're scared and they're intimidating, you, you often tell them, um, or there are other ways to get that information out. And if, and it's often not just the driver's license, they figure out other ways to, to get you because they want to and they're racist. Like often, I'm not saying all police officers are racist, but it's it's a trend that I've been seeing. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, she said that um, ten, uh, not Tennessee had uh, more lax policies, and in New Jersey, is that what you're saying? New Jersey started cracking down on driver's licenses from Tennessee. Not like officially, but like yeah. Um, I, I'm not sure if that would happen. Necess like, it's hard to track that, right? Because like you said, it's like informal. Like I, I know that they know that a lot of the community gets driver's licenses from Ohio. And so I think if they saw a, an Ohio driver's license, they might. And, and they also don't speak English and like all these things. Like I'm sure they're calculating in their heads. 
but it, it's a good question. Um, one, one challenge in the driver's license campaign is that there's been a bill proposed um, to give people that don't have social security numbers driver's licenses, but to put a little star on it um, that indicates that they're undocumented. And um, I don't want to offend anyone but when I say this, but that makes me think of the Star of David, like that you have to, like you have like a sign on you that says, this is like, I don't have these documents. And so, for example, if a police officer stops them and they see that star, they could just call ICE on them. So, it, it, but, but it's a very small um, detail, and a lot of people don't understand the significance of that. So it's like, yeah, we'll get them driver's licenses, just a little star. But the effect on people's lives um, that little star has is enormous. Yeah, go ahead. So going back to what you mentioned about entering a private residence or a vehicle, is that because they, once the doors open, they can see that that person, who that person is, and recognize what their status is? Because otherwise, a retired state trooper can't just walk into somebody's home even though they just open the door. Yeah, and even if um, the trespassing law in Pennsylvania is that even if you are legally somewhere and the, um, and but if you're asked to leave um, and you don't leave, that is also considered trespassing. Um, but again, it depends on the police department that's there that um, if they want to enforce that against an ICE agent because there's probably ramifications. Um, but can you repeat your question? I'm sorry. No, so I just was trying to determine, figure out based on what you were saying in terms of what gave them the right to actually enter a residence just because the, the individual opened the door. So I wondered if it was um, the status of that individual, they recognize the individual that gives them the ability to go and get them. If you have a home and I knock on your door and you enter it, I have the legal right to enter it. It doesn't matter if I'm an ICE agent or anyone else. If you give me permission to enter into your house by open, so opening the door is considered permission. Th this is what I've been seeing. But like, yeah, I, think they're bending the law. I, I agree. That, oh, sorry. He said, I think they're bending the law. Yeah. If we went to someone's home as a, as a trooper and we're looking for someone, if we saw them, yeah. We, we, can, we can go after them into the home. If we not, we didn't recognize who that person was, you had, there's, there's state law, there's federal law that basically said, no, you don't have the right to just enter yeah. home. Or the vehicle. Vehicle, too, there's laws that apply. Now, vehicles are, since they're movable, and you have exigent circumstances, so yeah, I could see where that, they could just read. But them reaching in like that, that's, that's, yeah, but I can see yeah, why they, they would do, do it. it. Yeah. I can see why they would do it unless they're challenged, and they're not going to be challenged by somebody who's undocumented. Well, and also uh, challenging them, uh, yeah, is is different uh, with state troopers than for ICE agents. So, so he was saying that, um, oh boy, <laughs> that no, 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 that's okay. Um, that um, I, I think you're kind of questioning whether opening the door. Um, do they have to recognize the person and like have probable call, cause? Yeah. Maybe, um, no. Uh, from my experience, everything that I've seen with ICE agents, no. Once the door is open, that's free game. Yeah. Same, and same with windows and, yeah. And, and I agree that um, morally it's definitely questionable and I don't know enough about legally on whether or not it's questionable, but I would love it. I, love, I would love for it to be questioned legally. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, also, if anyone, I don't know how timing works, but if, if I have to wrap up. OK, cool. Yeah. Um, in terms of, you were saying a bit earlier that police pressings kind of have jurisdiction over whether they will be responsive to ICE requests or not. Or does the mayor of Pittsburgh, does he decide? Or do individual police chiefs decide? Good question. So um, who decides on, the question was, who decides on whether they collaborate with ICE? Uh, police department collaborates with ICE? Good question. Um, that is also, I do have a slide later on that, um, but it's the individual police jurisdiction that decides. I can tell you that Pittsburgh police, uh, all six zones do not collaborate with ICE, and that means that they do not respect warrants, uh, they, do not hand, they do not hold people um, and w waiting for ICE to arrive, uh, they do not ever contact ICE if they suspect that someone is undocumented or they know their immigration status. Um, yeah, so Pittsburgh Police does not collaborate with ICE, but I, w I will talk about that later and like the process involved in that. Oh, I haven't even started on advocacy. Oh boy. Okay, well the first one is essentially your question. Um, Pittsburgh is a welcoming city. Um, 
Who here has heard about sanctuary cities? Yeah, what's a sanctuary city? <laughs> they won't cooperate with ICE. They won't co uh, cooperate with ICE, sure. Um, each city can define what that means. Uh, it's a term, but there's no universal definition of what a sanctuary city is, because what does collaborate with ICE mean? Um, there, there's so many different ways to do it. It's so exciting, right? Um, sorry, that was very that was sarcastic. Um, um, but um, so officially, Pittsburgh is a welcoming city. Uh, Casa San Jose actually worked with um, the city with city officials, and we decided that um, using the term sanctuary was not beneficial to us. Um, one is um, I'm not sure if people have seen um, the federal government. Um, not verbally, I guess tweetorially over, over Twitter, <laughs> attacking sanctuary cities, um, but also threatening to cut funding. And that's a reality. Um, we, um, we, are we, as Casa San Jose, are advocating for better policing policies in the surrounding areas of Pittsburgh. And the first question I got when I was at Duquesne City Council, Duquesne is a city just outside of Pittsburgh, um, was, does that make us a sanctuary city? And I was like, if you would like to be a sanctuary city, that is a different thing you need to vote on, and you can define that how it is. What I'm talking about now is your policing policy and updating it. Um, so, um, but yeah, there is a danger that sanctuary cities might be targeted. And so we decided um, when we worked on the policing policy of Pittsburgh, of the city of Pittsburgh, um, to call it a welcoming city. But it's a term. Uh, welcoming, sanctuary, you can, each city defines it differently. Philly is a sanctuary city. Philly has much more ice arrests than Pittsburgh. Um, a lot of cities in California are sanctuary cities and they have astronomical rates of detentions. And so, yeah, it doesn't mean that you're safe just because you're in a sanctuary city. Uh, driver's licenses for all. I'll continue talking about that because I care a lot about it. Um, Pittsburgh Free Thought Community, am I allowed to say that? Okay. <laughs> um, has uh, done a sign-on letter saying that they support this campaign. So sorry if you didn't know that already, <laughs> but it's a good campaign. Um, so um, we have, um, I don't know how many groups have signed on yet already, but at least 40 groups statewide um, that are trying to get driver's licenses for all. Um, we're working with PennDOT, the Pennsylvania Department of Transportation, to work on the logistics of it. We'll be introducing a bill I believe in the state house first, but maybe the Senate first. Um, we have written the uh, bill. We've actually had the input of the C CMU tech students on um, data security. So thank you, CMU, because <laughs> uh, I know nothing about technology. <laughs> um, and um, I mean, the, I could go for days as to why drivers, like the effect that having a driver's license um, has on the rest of your life. Um, but. Uh, we're, we're also working with um, youth um, that are telling their stories about how scared they are to watch their parents drive away every day. Like it's, it's, a, it's a piece of plastic, but it's a lot more than that. Um, so um, this particular, actually let me make sure, yeah, I'll just go on to the next slide. Um, is your campaign complicated by Pennsylvania's push for real ID? Uh, it's not. Uh, it's two campaigns. Uh, Real ID uh, does not include driver's licenses. It's, it's identification, which is good um, because you need identification, for example, to pick up your kid from school if you're not like on that list, right? Like identification is extremely important, but we want driver's licenses because it it includes more protections, right? So, I mean, I thought that the federal government was saying your ability to fly is going to be compromised if Pennsylvania is not a state compliant with real ID. Uh, so, oh, I forgot to repeat the question. Um, she's asking about real ID. You can't get real ID in Pennsylvania now. You have to pay separately for it, apply for it separately. But my understanding is there's a real push to get that accomplished. And what I would say is that given that push, I would see that that would complicate their push. Um, so the she's federal government wanting real ID, your ability to fly, get on, whatever, they're not going to, I, I can't see the state saying, oh, we want to be not in compliance with you don't, that. So you don't have to have real ID. You do if you want to fly, but right. if your driver's license, if you don't Or if you want to be, you want to get on certain federal facilities, yeah. et cetera. Yeah. 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 yeah, otherwise you don't need, you, you need real ID after October to fly. Otherwise, if you don't want to 
if you don't want to pay the extra money, you don't need real ID. So they're, they're talking about real ID and how um, the benefits of it, but also complicating it, like having two maybe parallel fights um, well, I and confusing them. Wanting to comply with the federal government, not necessarily yeah. being less open to this desire because of that. Yeah. You saw that in your campaign. Yeah, we've been having to clarify, um, like the why we're asking for driver's licenses and not real ID. I can tell you that our community does not use airplanes as a mode of travel, and so that doesn't really help our community. Also, for real ID, your documentation includes birth certificate, social security card. There you go. You need a social security number for real ID. I personally have not dealt with real ID, and that explains it. Yeah. Well, I thought that. Um, Immigrants could get social security numbers even if they don't have, but it's just considered a tax identification. Yeah, so so she was asking so what about... What stops them from being able to get a driver's license? What are the barriers to getting a social, essentially a social security number is really what you're asking because you need a social security number in order to get a driver's license, right? And so it's not hard to get a social security number even as a... I beg to differ. It is extremely difficult for people that... <laughs> I have not gone through the immigration legal process to get a social security number. So you're saying if they don't have a green card or a visa, they can't get one. Yeah, and the so popular... Lots of people who have H2B visas or things like that can't. So certain visas allow for you to have a social security number, certain visas do not. Um, an ITIN number, um, an individual tax identification number, I believe, um, is used for people that pay taxes but don't reap the benefits from those taxes. Um, and actually, I have the number. Numbers are great. Um, in Pennsylvania, an estimated um, undocumented people esti or contribute about $135 million in taxes annually. Um, so that's through the ITIN number, not through the Social Security number. They are working, they are paying taxes, but they do not have a Social Security number, so they are not reaping the benefits of the $139 million about that they are putting in. It is extremely difficult for an undocumented person to get a Social Security number. It takes, on average, two, three years is my guess. So even if you have that tax ID from the Social Security Administration, you're saying you can't use that to get a driver's license? No, not in Pennsylvania. You cannot use an ITIN number to get a driver's license in Pennsylvania. That's correct. Yeah, or what I said is correct. Um, yeah, so it's it takes a long time, a thousands of, probably dozens of thousands of dollars in legal fees to get to a point where you have a Social Security number. And so, um, yeah. Uh, so when, when we talk about the driver's license campaign, yeah, there are confusions. Like we have like the proposal to have like a driver's license but a little star on it or the real ID. Um, but what we are fighting for is just unmarked driver's licenses um, for various reasons. I think that I may have laid out already. Um, so um, I, I will get into strategy if people are interested. Um, but. Um, those are the representatives that we are looking to target in order to pass um, this legislation. Um, if, any, if anyone recognizes these names, a lot of them are Republicans. Um, yep. That's and so, <laughs> yeah, I won't even repeat that. We don't have to. Um, and um, the reason being that um, the way the political makeup of the House, the Pennsylvania House and Senate are such that um, we cannot pass this with only the support of Democrats. Um, and so our strategy um, is that, um, especially in rural Pennsylvania, central Pennsylvania, um, farm, the Farm Workers Bureau, I want to say, um, I don't think I have it written down, but um, in central Pennsylvania, a lot of uh, farm workers are undocumented and they need vehicles to be able to do their work. And so um, we are getting the support of the Farm Workers Bureau. The other is the Catholic Diocese of Pennsylvania. Um, it's interesting that I'm at the Free Thought <laughs> group, um, but um, they are, um, they typically, a lot of Latinos are Catholic, and um, but um, Catholics are often very conservative and they have a lot of influence on, a, on these representatives. Um, so um, those are two strategies that we're using um, to advocate um, for these particular people, but really any state representative um, to support this bill that we um, will be proposing in the next couple of months. Um, what we are doing at a local level is we are sharing stories um, on how not having a driver's license affects people. Um, we are 
reaching out to other groups um, to see if they'd be interested in like power building. I know that's a very general term and it probably means nothing, but um, just um, getting people to support this legislation. And if you have, if people have contacts um, with people that live in those districts, um, and also Allegheny County, I'm not sure, yeah, I put it up there too, but um, we're trying to get this legislation passed so that people can drive safely and regain the right that was taken away from them. So that's one of our advocacy campaigns. Um, should I be going through this faster? Yeah. Okay. Okay, cool. Um, universal representation. Um, the district attorney's office provides um, pro bono attorneys for criminal people that have criminal convictions. Does anyone know if immigration courts provide pro bono services? I'm seeing a head shake no, and that is correct. Um, and when you think about the people that need these services, they, it's a completely new um, legal system that they are in. And so they're the people that need it most. And um, immigration attorneys are expensive. Um, it costs about $2,000 for a bond hearing. So you're paying thousands of dollars for the bond, but you also have to pay for legal services. Um, and the chance that if you have people that have legal representation for the bond hearings are 70% more likely to get, a, um, to get granted bond than people that aren't. And so <laughs> when you, you think, oh, well, it's just an attorney, they can represent themselves, but there are numbers that say that that's, the results are not as good. Um, the Colcom Foundation, does anyone know what the Colcom Foundation is? Anti it's interesting. They are anti-immigration, but they also have another agenda, and it's they support pretty much every environmental organization in Pittsburgh. Um, Phipps Conservatory. Um, oh, so many organizations. Um, I imagine the Sierra Club, um, Clean Air Council, like. Uh huh. Yep. Parks Conservancy. Yeah. Um, they all get money from Colcom. Um, and it, what, the person that established it was an heiress of the, escape. yeah, Teresa May Scaife, yeah, which um, is a, Mellon. oh, Mellon, that's right, thank you, yeah, um, and she founded it, and she was an environmentalist, but she believed pretty, uh, she had a Malthusian um, belief that um, we need fewer people for this environment, but if anyone understands anything about immigration, it's not that there are fewer people, it's just that they're in a different location. <laughs> Um, so I have some clear logical problems, never mind moral problems with this foundation, but they fund a lot of things in Pittsburgh, but they also give money straight to Immigration and Customs Enforcement. Uh, Numbers USA, which is a conservative think tank, um, oh, I forget all their names, but all the, all the immigrant hate groups get money from Colcom and their office is downtown in Pittsburgh. So that's something that we're <laughs> constantly fighting against. Shut down the Berks, does anyone know what Berks is? What's Burks? It's a family detention center in Pennsylvania. There are three family detention centers in the United States. Two are in Texas. One is in Berks County, Pennsylvania. Um, if anyone wants to get on board that campaign, um, they're super active. Um, I would say Facebook or any other social media. You can find them at Shutdown Berks. Um, public charge. Has anyone heard of public charge? Um, public charge is... Um, in order to get a visa or a green card um, and other statuses, but pr primarily those, do those two, uh, you have to pass uh, essentially a financial test. Um, will you be a burden or a public charge on society? And if you are, if your income is too low, um, then they think that you will be a charge on society and they can reject your visa or green card based on that. That is economic discrimination. <laughs> In a nutshell, it's right there. And economic discrimination usually corresponds with racial discrimination. Um, so the public charge rule went into effect on Monday, um, despite a long fight. Um, PennDOT, uh, Fair Fares with Pittsburghers for Public Transit, that's what PPT is. Um, we're working with Pittsburghers for Public Transit um, to, with, on language access. Uh, there's a proposal with um, in Pittsburgh to um, change the payment method, which would involve bringing um, 
uh, Port Authority police onto um, buses and trains. Um, and there's a lot of issues um, that pertain sp specifically to the immigrant community. One is the trauma that the community has faced at the hands of law enforcement, especially armed law enforcement, which is part of that proposal. Um, and the other, again, is a language barrier. They would be given a citation if they didn't pay, but what if they can't communicate that they paid? Um, so there's a lot of issues with that that we've been working on. The census has been eating up a lot of my time. Um, Latinos and undocumented folks um, are um, historically undercounted on the census, but particularly undocumented folks because, um, well, there is a proposal to include a citizenship question on the census. And now we know the reason uh, that they did that was to discourage undocumented folks from, or people that had documentation but were scared from filling out the census, which then brings less representation in financial resources to the region. Um, so that's another fun fear tactic that the federal government's using. Um, jail outreach. There is a contra uh, there was um, a court case between the ACLU and Allegheny County Jail um, that states that Allegheny County Jail cannot um, call ICE and let them know that undocumented folks are at uh, Allegheny County Jail. And I currently have six documented cases that prove that they have violated that settlement. Um, so another fun thing that we're working on with the, with the warden of Allegheny County Jail, who is a warden. <laughs> um, and then adequacy around policing policies is the last one that I wanted to mention. Um, again, we already went over that Pittsburgh is a welcoming city. I already mentioned the 130 municipalities. Um, when we do know your rights sessions and we tell them that Pittsburgh police don't um, collaborate with ICE, um, it's difficult to explain jurisdictions. If you live in Beachview, but you work in Mount Oliver, for example, which is a little island like within Pittsburgh police that have their own police department, um, it's hard for them to understand like what are the blocks that make up this region and that they're not safe when they cross the block, essentially. Um, so slowly but surely, I have a list of now 32 police departments where we've been doing right to know requests. We've been reaching out to people that live in those areas to reach out to authorities um, and ask them what their policing policy is. A lot of them don't have policing policies. And by policing policies, I mean, I do have a list of questions that we asked that I'm just going to rattle through because I think it's really interesting. Oh, maybe I'm just a nerd on this, but um, how do they deal with people that don't speak English? For interpretation, do they have a phone number that they call? Do they use that as an indicator that the person might be undocumented or not have legal status? Do they have a police or training program um, on racial profiling? Uh, when do they call federal agents, agencies like the FBI, USCIS, CBP, ICE, and DHS during a stop in processing? and when they cannot identify someone because they do not have identification, which brings us back to real ID and driver's licenses and all that fun stuff. Um, do they allow those agencies to access their database? Security, CMU helping us uh, work, come up with good wording on that. Do they respect ICE or DHS holds and warrants? Do they record the immigration status of people involved in incidents? Um, there's a program um, called the 287G program where um, ICE ought uh, sorry, police officers can elect to be trained by ICE and almost function as an ICE agent within the police department. Do they participate in that program? Um, yeah, so those are some of the questions that we ask when we reach out to, to the surrounding police department so that, um, for example, if I get a call saying uh, my husband just got a speeding ticket in Bellevue versus Castle Shannon, I can tell you, oh, we need to bring 10 people to that court hearing or go, you're fine. Um, so it's pretty important work that affects uh, people's lives pretty directly. I kind of sped through that part. Um, are there any questions on that? Um, if anyone wants to get involved or wants to look at this list and say, oh, I know someone that lives here that might have a contract with the secretary of the mayor's office, that would help me a lot. Or if anyone is really interested in right to know requests, which is the local version of the Freedom of Information Act request, which is at the national level. Definitely come talk with me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, so we're part of a state coalition with the ACLU, and they've been helping us um, like work on our, um, our presentations. And we also, um, 
have monthly calls, um, statewide calls that talk about what have we been seeing at a statewide level. Um, like, all right, in Lancaster, they've been targeting this group. Like, have we been seeing that in Pittsburgh? They have not been knocking on doors in this area. Have they been knocking on doors in this area? And so we've been collaborating in that sense. Um, but uh, we especially reach out to the ACLU when we believe that civil liberties um, have been violated as they're known to help with. Um, and so, for example, if someone was pulled over by a police officer that was racially pro profiling them and then they were picked up by ICE, that initial contact was actually illegal. And so, um, you know, we, there are legal options involved in that. So that's one way that we have been working on Know Your Rights stuff with how do you, them. How do you call racial? Oh. <laughs> Am I like a, well, um, so one, my first uh, phone call I ever got in this job um, was, um, after, so someone was pulled over by police, I forget the jurisdiction, I think it may have been Mount Lebanon, um, who I can tell you has racist police officers, that's not really news. Um, and they, um, the person's boss, he showed up, he did, never showed up to work, and so his boss uh, heard that he was pulled over because it was his vehicle, he was driving, the client, the community member was driving his boss's vehicle, and the boss went down to uh, the police station and he asked, uh, why did you pull him over? And the um, police officer said, because he looked illegal. Oh. And unfortunately, we weren't recording that. Um, but um, if I had time, I, I never did it. But um, we could write to no request the, um, the police report on that stop and, figure, and see what he wrote down for pulling him over. Um, and if there's a way to prove that what he wrote down was false, because he had to have made something up, because you can't unless he's real stupid and wrote that, um, then that's, that would, for example, be a good way to prove that he was racially profiled. Yeah. That's all I got for you, I think. That's it. Uh, yeah. If anyone wants, I printed out, like, kind of stuff on um, driver's licenses if people are interested in that campaign. I also have our list of townships and boroughs that we're um, looking to document and kind of the status on whether or not we submitted a right to know request yet and what uh, documents were released, if any were released, because sometimes they come up with fun excuses to not release documents. Um, but if anyone's interested in getting involved in either of those campaigns, you can take this information or you can speak with me. Thanks. Let's thank Laura again. All right, and as we mentioned, if you're interested in getting more information about any of these campaigns or what Casa San Jose is doing at large, you can come speak to Laura afterward or take some information. Um, if you're interested in working with the PFC um, to be involved with our activism efforts more at large, you can come talk to me after the talk. And Andy, I believe you wanted to say some words about... Yeah, well, if you are American citizens living in Pennsylvania right now, um, you're allowed to vote in the Thank you everybody so much for coming.